uh, John, the ninth chapter, looking at uh, five verses. <laughs> we've been in it. We, 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 this is going to re be related to the subject we've been involved in. Um, actually, this series is called Family, uh, Marriage and Family. And uh, this whole thing started with uh, Exodus 24 through 6. But, and here's a, here's a case. And so we've been studying that and looking how that um, visiting the iniquity uh, uh, of the parents on the children business to the third and fourth generations. Uh, well, anyhow, here's a passage that deals with it, and it's a good passage on it because there's complete misunderstanding of it. And we've understood a principle around here ever since we studied the book of Job that a, a, a fault about a false assumption Right, A false assumption leads to a false interpretation that leads to a false expectation that leads to a false application. And this is a perfect example of that out of Exodus 20 with the blind man. You remember the blind man healed from birth. Okay, Here, here's the story. And as he, Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he should be born blind. Now, they're getting that out of, out of Exodus 20, 4 through 6, and it's a misinterpretation. Jesus answered, neither. Neither. Neither the man said nor his parents. But, it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. So he answers it and then explains it. And then in verse 4 he says, We must work the works of him who sent me. Who does he mean by we? Well, we or us, it's okay. Who's he, who's he talking to? His disciples. Look at, verse, look at verse 2. His disciples ask him this question. Now, that's, a, that's a, a false assumption, a false misreading of Exodus 24 through 6. Where did they get this? They got it from apostate religion is where they got it. It's pharisaical. You're going to see the same mindset that they have later in this story the Pharisees have. Same one. So where did they get it? Well, they got, out, got it from their teaching. Where did they get it? Well, they got out of their little handbook they carried around that was equal with the Word of God, right, in their mind. But anyhow, it's important and we understand. He said, we, speaking to his disciples, we must work the works of him who sent me. Didn't say us. I mean, how is, how, listen to me. You, you're missing all this. How important it is to understand who you are to follow. You, you, listen, you don't follow me. If you're following me, you got the wrong leader. All right? I mean, I teach the word of God for you to follow Christ. Make no bones about it. You're not following me. I fall in a ditch. Guess where are you going to go? All right? I mean, you got you to follow somebody. Don't fall in ditches. <laughs> he can leap, them, leap over them. We must work the works of him who sent me. As long as it is day, night is coming when no man can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Okay? You know who's going to get to see both the light of the world and the light of in it? Is this blind man. He's never seen light. Can you imagine? He's lived in darkness. Hasn't he? Isn't, he was born in darkness. Now, the truth of the matter, we all are. But it's spiritual. It's not physical. This man was born in spiritual darkness 
and in physical darkness. And he's going to, listen, the wonderful part of this story, it has a happy ending. It's a hallmark. It's a hallmark. Yeah. I mean, it's going to have a happy, don't you love those things? Thank God they're on television. The rest of it's not worth watching. Uh, because, they, because, listen, they have a happy ending. The other night, we, Jane said, I want you to come, I want you to come, come, come be sure. Now, set aside that we watch this story, uh, something about the hearts. Right, right. Well, so she said because this is supposed to be an exciting thing, and so I get, I'm all prepared for. Yeah, uh, halfway through the thing, I'm sitting over there crying. She's crying. Oh, what's wrong with me? They got to me, and uh, I said, I think I'm going to go back. If you don't mind, I think I'll go back downstairs. I was losing my manhood. I said, if you don't mind, I think I'll go back downstairs and, and study a little bit. And she said, oh, no, this is a hallmark. You know it's going to have a happy ending. And so I thought he'd come back at the end some way or another. Well, anyhow. Um, so this, this is the text. And I'm after this idea of, in verse 2, who sinned? See my title? Who sinned? Who sinned? And they, what's the answer? Well, as far as the, the man, it wasn't his parents and it wasn't him as far as the question who. who. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into this. We'll kind of take a look at it in, in some detail. As, as a believer, by that I mean you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. And by that act of faith because you live in the new covenant the holy spirit took up residence in your inside your body and he is there forever john 14 16 he came there to point his salvation galatians 3 2 and he is what brings spiritual life to the bible in your life it's a spiritual book for spiritual people born again for spiritual living the holy spirit will teach you the spiritual truth that's his title, and he will bring it to application in your life. You can't study the Bible, and you can't apply it in carnality. Evidence of carnality would be personal sin. Evidence of it in your life, you would know that. Personal sin, it could be mental attitude sins, or overt sins, or sins of the tongue. If you're aware of it, then you should confess it to the Father through your priesthood of First Peter 2. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's an important factor because it brings you back to 1 John 1, 5 through 1 John 1, 7. So back into fellowship with God. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way by the automobile and by the internet. We pray the Holy Spirit uh, would minister the truth of the word of God as he's declared he will to positive volition. That's those who have confessed their sin. We're not asking you to change your life, but we are asking you to confess your sins so that your attitude towards the truth of the word of God will be open to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in Jesus name. Amen. So uh, once again, uh, we're going to look at a lesson out of the New Testament text, which is about this. This is a misunderstanding of Exodus 20, 4 through 6, when they said, when they said, well, who sinned, the parents or the or the person? Listen, he he was born blind. The, the, the rabbis got so nutty with this whole thing that they believed that a child in the womb could commit such a sin that he some kind of a sin in the womb that he would come out blind. Um it is some screwy stuff, but that shouldn't surprise us. There are a lot of screwy stuff out there today because people just don't pay attention to the word of God anymore. Here's the question uh, that, that is posed in verses 9, 1 through 2. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man is a parent. Watch, that he would be born blind. And his answer, do I? 
Yeah, we are, but not necessarily physical. See, they're not even touching the spiritual part of this. I mean, they're saying that he was born blind because of some sin either committed by him or by his parents. And where would they even get that? That comes from Exodus, a misunderstanding of Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6, which we've been studying for about, I don't know, maybe <laughs> four weeks. I don't know. We've been studying a long time. Uh, the concept, and we've been moving all over the Bible to show you the concept and mi misunderstanding because it's really about poor, poor spiritual training of children is what that's about. But there's a passage where there's a misunderstanding about it in there. But this is where they're getting it. Okay. The lesson tonight is going to look at four aspects of the misunderstanding of Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6, and the four generations of curse and the subject. The subject is who sinned. This man or his parents, that he should be born blind. Jesus responded, neither. Now look what look how he answered the question. First he said, neither, right? But then he answered it. Listen to how he answered it. Because then he's going to go on and explain with the word we. Remember why I called your attention to that. Listen to what he says. He said, it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. I want you to do something with me. I'm going to show you where he's trying to take them. I want you to go, we're, we're in John, so let's drop over to Luke. Back up, let's go to the fourth chapter. We're going to go to the fourth chapter, and we're going to, go to verse 18. 4, 4, 18. Now, this is, you, this is a famous story. Jesus goes to his home uh, uh, synagogue in Nazareth, the Nazareth synagogue, and uh, he's going to be the reader for the day. He picks up the Bible, opens to Isaiah, or maybe it was already open to Isaiah. Nobody knows for sure. Sometimes they let the guest o open and read, and sometimes it was already open for him to read. We don't know which way it was, but either way, I mean, God's in control. So either way, it was the right passage for him to have. And what he's quoting, I'm down there in uh, 1819, what he's quoting is Isaiah 1-2. Now, what's, listen to me now. What's interesting about Isaiah 61, it's a messianic, messianic passage. The only part, and, and when you read a messianic passage as a rule, especially in a prophet like Isaiah Jeremiah, etc., a Joel. When you read a passage and they talk about, it, usually a passage is going to have the coming of Christ first and second in a passage. We didn't know there was a first, second coming of Christ until the church came. And the church sat down in between the two. The church was the mystery. That's why they didn't know it. You understand? So I tell you this a hundred times when they read a passage. Now, what's interesting is that Jesus only reads verse 1 and 2. Verse 1 and 2 deals with the first coming of Christ. The rest of it is dealing with the second coming of Christ. Are you with me? He only reads verse 1 and 2. Then he closes the book and sets down. Now watch this. Here we are. Uh, in verse 14, he's returned. Uh, and verse 16, he's in Nazareth. And he's at his home synagogue. On the Sabbath, and he stood up, verse 17, the book of the prophet was handed, uh, the, the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He opened the book, and he found the place where it was written. This is how my New American Standard reads it. And he reads verse 1 and 2. He says, now I want you to watch it. Watch what, listen. There are five, now listen to me. There are five signs of Messiah here. Five, I want you to make sure you find them. There are five. John 9, now listen to me. John 9 deals with one of the five. Could be a gate question, so pay attention. So here's what he starts. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, they know this is a messianic passage. This congregation is good, knows that. He doesn't have to explain the passage. He opens it up and says that. And listen, here's a wonderful thing. The me, 
of Messiah is Jesus of Nazareth. What a what a wonderful day this has got to be in his life. Huh? To be in his home church in his, with his home people, people he went to school with, people he he'd gone through the whole 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 synagogue celebrations and all that with these people. And open that book up and, and, and read that this, and he's actually the Messiah, that he's actually Christ. After 900 years, he's going to fulfill this thing. Boom. So the spirit of the Lord is upon me because, now watch the twos, because he, he has anointed me, he has, because he's anointed me, look at the me's in this thing. They're all capital, aren't they? Yeah, because it's Christ. This is the second member of the Godhead. He anointed me to preach the gospel. Now, why? I, I, pay attention now. Here's what's important about what we're going to say. God, God laid this out. You got what he's going to do and who it's to. Now, pay attention to that, right? What he's going to do and how it's going to affect a specific person he's going to do it to. Are you with me? Do not miss this. All right. I'm going to preach the gospel to the what? To the poor. He says, preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the Captives and to the recovery of sight. So we know which one here is working in our passage, don't we? How many is that? Three. Who's keeping count? I am. To set free those who are downtrodden or brokenhearted. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Right? Of the Lord. He's going to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. You know what that is? That's him. The favorable year of the Lord. Guess what? Guess what favorable year this is? It's, it's right now in his, this synagogue. He, he, is, he has introduced himself through his home synagogue, through his home people, to the nation of Israel, and introduced them through them to the world. Because he's come for the world. Drop down to verse 28 and see how this service went. See how, did they get the message? Oh, yeah. It all went negative. Look at verse 28. And all in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they rose up and cast him out of the city and led him to a, a brow of the, of the hill on, uh, on which the city had been built in order to throw him down off the cliff. <laughs> Buddy, you're talking about a d bad day of preaching. <laughs> I've had some bad days, but they've never been that bad. And listen, welcome to the ministry, Jesus. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just interesting, isn't it? It's just interesting. So what we have in and what we have in John nine is he has come for the blind to receive to be re restored to 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 um, uh, how do you say that um, to recover the recover the sight of the blind. And, he, and listen, in, when he winds up here, the, the Pharisee is going to say, well, are you saying we're blind? He went, <laughs> we'll, know in, we'll know in about 10 minutes. 
Oh, well, they're taking me to throw me off a mountain. So I guess, <laughs> I guess you're blind. I guess. I don't know. These five signs are really important because he's introduced the five characteristics or signs that the Messiah has to fulfill. And if you follow his life, you will find that these, these five signs are very important. Very important. And, and, and maybe I'll come back one day and I'll do a study of, of different occasions when he did this. And we can see the, the dynamics of the drama of it, like this story. Um, point number one. Once again, we see the doctrinal principle of the danger of false assumption in the Christian way of life. We learned this principle, you and I learned it in this church, from the study of the life of Job when I taught it. Uh, and the, the principle is that false assumptions, and th this is just common, effort. you can see it anywhere in the Bible once you know it, leads to false interpretation, lead false expectations to false application. Here's a phrase you hear all the time, it's not true. I'm going to give you one. I'm going to give you one. I hear it all the time, and it drives me nuts. Here's the phrase. I, just, I heard it the other day. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. And then, and then you know what they attack? They attack God. They attack God. They attack God. They attack the character of God. Without exception, they're going to attack the character of God. James 1.13 says that that's not true. That God doesn't do that. James 1.13. We just studied it. We just came out of that study out of James 1.13. Not last week, but the week prior. God does not tempt. God, do, God does not work that way. Romans 8, 28 tells us he doesn't do that. It is not part of the character of God. They, the devil puts that out there. People believe that foolishness. People in the church believe that kind of foolishness and attack the character of God. The devil is deceptive. He's a liar. He is the father of lies. John 8 chapter. We should never listen to that foolishness. <laughs> I mean, here's what here here's the truth about this blind man. Here's what God wants to do with that blind man. He wants to do a work of God in his life. That's what Jesus said, right? He want listen and listen. That's what God wants to do in every person in this room. Do you, listen? Are you open to letting God do a work in your life? Listen. Mm, you say you are, but every time He begins to mess with you the way you've got your organized set up life you're in your little comfort zone every time he wiggles the comfort zone in your life you have a you have a fit you have a fit why me what are you doing to me you go into that that insane place in your mind and and then you begin to attack the character of god You whine, you moan, you groan. Listen, every time you get in that state of mind, read the book of Job. He went through the same stuff. Listen, don't, don't, don't attack the character of God. Don't let people persuade you that's what you ought to do. Well, if I followed a God that did that, I wouldn't follow him. And I, well, what God would you follow? That would be better than God Almighty. Because you're going to follow some, one of them. What God would you choose that would be better to you than God Almighty? I mean, who sent, who, which religion are you going to go where he sent his son to die for your sins to offer you eternal life? That's his. You know why we get caught in this kind of stuff? Because we're, we're not students of the Word of God. We're not students of the Word of God. Or you may go to church. You may open the Bible every blue moon. You know, when things really get rough, you go to the Word of God. You got to go to the Word of God all the time. <coughs> Notice that the disciples' false assumption, right? They had a false assumption. 
Notice that the disciples' false assumption was learned from the apostate pharisaical teachings in John 9. Later, in the 16th verse of the ninth chapter, the Pharisees were saying, this man, talking about Jesus, who healed this man. They attacked Jesus because he healed on the Sabbath because they didn't know the scriptures that said the Messiah would be Lord of the Sabbath. Mark 2.27. Therefore, the Pharisees were saying, this man, Jesus Christ, is not from God because he broke one of our laws. He broke the Sabbath law. He didn't break it. He fulfilled it. He didn't come to abolish the law. He didn't come to break the law. He came to fulfill it. In verse 34, this same group of people, this apostate pharisaical group, they answered him, the blind man, you were born entirely in sin and you're trying to teach us. So they threw him out. Now, here's a man that has not been permitted to go to the synagogue, has not been permitted to go to the temple because his blindness has been attached by these religious people as sin. So they've excommunicated him. He finally has got his physical sight, now wants to be part of a, a believing community that he's not been able to go to. And they throw him out after he got his sight because he got it on the Sabbath by a man who's Lord of the Sabbath. They, they threw everybody under the bus. That's apostate religion, people. That's apostate religion. And it's the enemy of God. This, this, this group of it and the disciples have grown up under that kind of teaching until Jesus got a hold of them, and now he's trying to get the old thinking out and the new thinking in. And it's difficult. Listen, around here, people usually get fed up with the teaching of the Word of God and leave to go for goofiness. They get fed up with it. I'm tired of hearing this. I'm tired of hearing this. I'm tired of hearing this. Listen, you wouldn't be tired of hearing it if you, got, if, you, if you did get tired of applying it. Because when you apply it, you see it work, you want more. It's when you hear, 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 and don't believe, and don't believe, and don't believe, that you want to have a change. I don't see why we need to go every night of the week. <laughs> we don't go every night of the week, but I wish we could. It's, you know... Whether you're hungry or not, you become hungry. The more, the more you exercise your faith in the word of God, the more hungry you are in it because you see the dynamics of how God works according to his word. It's a fulfilling life. It's dry and boring if, if you're not willing to do that. Just saying. Point number two, the sins of the parents are not literally transmitted unto their children. That's not what Exodus 24 through 6 teaches. The sins of the parents are not literally transmitted unto their children. Listen, what's, well, the reason you need to get saved is because Adam's sins are transmitted. In Deuteronomy, we're in the book of the law. In Deuteronomy 24, 16, in the law... Fathers shall not be put to death for their sons, nor shall sons be put to death for their fathers. Everyone shall be put to death for his own sin. That is the law trying to make sure that nobody screws this principle up. In 2 Kings 14, there is a king of Judah who uses this very text in a legal case. That's how important this passage is. Deuteronomy 20, 24, 16. It's an interesting study, especially for those who like law stuff. Listen, in the great passage of Jeremiah, you know, in that passage where the new covenant, you remember? 
30, 30 through 34 in that path where the new covenant is declared? L listen to what verse 30 says. Everyone will die for his own iniquity. That's Jeremiah 31, 30. Each man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. Every man will die for his own iniquity. And that introduces the subject of the new covenant. See verses 31 through 34 introduces the subject. Why this passage is important to us is that no child or generations of children should ever think that they bear God's judgment for the personal sins of their parents. I meet people like that all the time. They've come from apostate churches that think that. And, and listen, it's an excuse not to take responsibility for them. Well, I guess that's just the way I am. Well, <laughs> but it's not the iniquity of your parents. It's the poor training. Not the iniquity of them. Well, I don't know how many times I have to read it. Everyone will die for his own iniquities. Everyone shall be put to death for his own sin. I mean, the subject matter is over and over and over and over again. All personal sins, listen to me, all personal sins are directed against God. All personal sins are against God. David said it in, in Psalms 51.4. David said it. David said, against you and you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. That's that deal with Bathsheba and her husband in that mess. Luke 15, 18, the prodigal son quotes that. He quotes that. He, listen, he's quoting that concept when he said, I have sinned against heaven and against you, God. See, that's how it works. You need to understand that. That's why you confess your sin to God, to the Lord. Now, here's point number three. The point of the four-generation curse of Exodus 20, 4 through 6, is, is poor. The, the reason it's there is for, it's a warning against poor spiritual training of the parents to their children. Because it's going to come back to bite you. It's going to come back to bite you. It's going to come back to bite you. And we all know this. If you've got kids, you know what I'm talking about. And if you're smart, you'll do your very best in raising your children uh, under Proverbs 22, 7. And if you live long enough, it'll come back. You got to catch them early. Can't wait till they're, they're 26, 27, 28, 9 when their brain is fully formed. You got to catch them while their brain is information is being formed. Well, I'm so thankful for my grandparents. They weren't religious people, but they were smart as a whip. They gave me more, more sense in my head than you could imagine. And I lived off it until I met Christ. I can't tell you how many times it kept me from going to jail. Don't go do that with those guys. Because they're going to go to jail. I said, let me out. I'm going home. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't care. Listen, we can fight about it, but we can do what we're going to do, but I'm going home. My grandpa, I get home. My grandpa said, why'd you walk home? And I said, because... They were going to shoot out the lights in the in the, it's the street lights in the town. That's why I'm late. And uh, when we went to school on Monday, guess what? Guess who was waiting for the school bus? And it wasn't waiting. They weren't waiting for me. I went home. I walked home. I walked five miles home. You know why? Because my grandma, my grandfather, put that wonderful principle in my head. You don't do that. This is stuff you do not do. That's a crime. You don't do that. And I went, I'm not going to do that. This would bring disgrace upon my, my, my grandparents. I, I wouldn't be able to stand that. I mean, the, the shame that it would bring to my grandfather. I, there's no way. I'll walk home in the rain. I don't care. Where did I get that? I got it from my grandfather out of love. I mean, I mean what kind of an old man would take a gopher like me and, and, and raise me. I mean, I was so deep a priest as a little child, I knew that. But anyhow, that's just my life. Deuteronomy, here's the passage where they, they were heavily instructed as we are to train our children in the ways of the Lord. 
Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, seven through nine. I love this passage. You circle that passage. You read that tonight. Not now, but you read that when you get home because you know what it says? This is what other nations, this is why other nations are not like you. This is what makes us unique as a nation. This is what makes us unique as a nation. In Deuteronomy 11, 19 through 21, it reminds us as Christians, as believers, that the home is the first place of worship. One of my uncles, we never thought we'd ever get him saved. He finally got saved. He lived up the street from where I lived. And he would come down all the time and want me to talk the Bible to him. He said he'd come down and get a cup of coffee and say, talk the Bible, talk, talk the Bible to me. Well, you know, I'd just find something. I knew he was going to come down at least two or three times a week after he got saved, come in, have a cup of coffee, sit down, say, teach the, teach, tell the Bible to me. Like a little kid, it says, read me a story out of the Bible. That was him. And we were having dinner as a family together, my two uncles and myself and their families. We were sitting at our dinner table. And my uncle Glenn, who was the guy who would come down every couple of days, uh, tell me the Bible, tell me the Bible. He always said, tell me the Bible, tell me the Bible. I want to tell me the Bible. And so I'd give him something he could hang on for that day. And he says to my Uncle Max, the other guy, he says to him, I love coming down to the Lord's house. And my Uncle Max said, you go to church? What are you talking about? You love to come down to the Lord. When do you come down to the Lord's house? He said, well, I come down at least two or three times a week. I have a cup of coffee. He said to me, we all went to Roebuck Park Baptist Church. And he said, Roebuck Park Baptist Church, and he went too. He said, the Roebuck Park Baptist Church is open in the morning to have coffee. I didn't know anything about that. And my Uncle Glenn says, what are you talking about? He said, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I said, where are we? so my Max says, where are you going? He says, right here. And my Uncle Max said, this can't be the house of the Lord. What are you talking about? This is the house of the Lord. He said, let me tell you, this is where I, I learned more Bible than anything. I come down here. This is the Lord's house. Ron, he said, is this not the Lord's house? I, I said, it is when you come. We go, but this is a place of worship where two or three are gathered. You come down and say, open the Bible. You've made my day. <laughs> and that's the first time it really dawned on me. So I, I began to search the Bible. Is the home the first? And certainly it is. It's the first place of worship. And I think sometimes we get so caught up in the church, we forget that. That the real teaching of the word of God, the real living of the word of God in the first wonderful experience of the family is in the home. And I remind us all of that today. The home is the place of worship. The home. The home. Believing parents and grandparents are instructed to teach and train their children in the, in the way of the Lord. Exodus to 12, 24 through 27 Right out, of the, right out of the shoot in the Exodus, he gives them this wonderful thing, the Passover angel and all that, and says, now, your kids, he says, your kids are going to ask you why you celebrate the Passover. And you're going to teach them, when they ask, you're going to teach them the truth of the word of God about it. So I want you to learn it. And that began this whole principle of the home as a place of worship. Now, we have passages for us in the church age. We have passages like Ephesians, the sixth chapter, one through four. If you have children or grandchildren, you should pay attention to that passage. Or maybe you're in hopes of having grandchildren. You should, along with Colossians 20 and 21. 20 and 21. I like 2 Timothy 1, 5. I use this a lot because it was helpful to me. I am mindful of the sincere, Paul's talking to Timothy, I am mindful of the sincere faith, I love that, of the simplicity of the truth that's in your soul. I love the fact, that that was my uncle, you couldn't give him a lot, he just came down to get a, a verse of hope for the day. And he would stay, hang on that till he come down and go on to another one. I mean, it was just interesting. I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, 
which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and then in your mother Eunice. And I am sure that it is in you as well. Don't you love that? And and 2 Timothy 3.15, I, I love 16 and 17, but 15 is wonderful. And from childhood, and from childhood, you have known the sacred scriptures. You can't start early enough to teach them. You know, little Ben that I put the B on the board for, he's, he's four. That little mind, I mean, they teach, he, he, he learns a Bible verse every day and can repeat every one he's learned a, a week. He learns a Bible verse a week, and, and he's been doing this for at least two years, and he's got them. Now, he got, he got bored with that, and so he's now memorized all of the capitals of all the states. And now he's on to presidents, learning all the presidents of the United States. I mean, that little mind. I mean, and he, this is not an unusual kid. This is just a curious kid that wants to be taught. Listen, almost all kids are that way if we'd spend any time with them. You know why this kid's like that? So, listen, the truth of the matter is, that's a stay-home mom that challenges her kids every day. You know, doesn't wait till they've gone eight hours and come home or four hours and come home. The, his feet hit the, hit the deck, and he wants to learn something. That little mind is, you know... I can only talk about my grandson. I don't know yours, but I mean, I'm amazed at what that little kid can do. He's just four, but that's every little kid. If we just spend a little time with him, I mean, he wants to read, read, read his, 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 you know, he's, he's, got, he's got more books. They have to sneak him out of the house and give him away to have room for more because <laughs> listen, it, they're just, their brain is ready. It's just amazing. He's learned Spanish. Because he was in a restaurant one day and heard uh, people uh, with, next to the waitress uh, talking to her. She was talking Spanish with him. He said, what is that? They said Spanish. He said, I want to learn it. He's off to the races with Spanish. So when he, they hear some of that kind of stuff, it's the darndest thing I've ever seen. And, and listen, he, you've, you've got, had kids like that. And the mother that really sees that in him, is just stirred by it. The biggest thing we have to do is calm Angie down because she gets nuts with it, you know. She gets nuts with it. And we say, look, let him play a little bit. Let him play a little bit. Uh, so from the childhood, you've known the sacred scripture. Well, able, listen, the sacred scripture, from a little child, these are the sacred scriptures. Watch this. Which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation and on to training and righteousness. Isn't that marvelous? That has, who? I mean, that's what God signs off on. You need to sign off on it because he's already signed off on it, boy. He's already signed off on it. We studied this in our previous lesson on this subject matter. Another example of the principle of poor training is, uh, is the pr high priest Eli. And we've talked a lot about him here too. You can read about his his life, and he did a miserable job training his two kids. Uh, in First uh, Samuel two two and four, and there's a part of this Exodus twenty four through six where God says one of the titles of my name, and don't forget it, is I'm a jealous God. He says I that he calls him by his name, not by his character, but by his name character. I'm a jealous God. And in 1 Samuel 2.29, when he calls Eli, out, the high priest, out, and he, has, he said, listen, I'm, you, you need to pay attention. You have been paying attention to me for years. You need to pay attention to me now. So put your eyeballs on me. And here's what he said. Listen to this. Why have you kicked? I call it throwing under the bus. Why have you kicked at my sacrifice? And watch the word my. Why have you kicked at my sacrifices? That was his job, high priest. And my offerings, which I commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me by taking the choices of every offering, which was Christ, away from the people of Israel. And, he, and he's about to lower the boom on this guy. He's going to lower the boom on him. The high priesthood, 
for, for this crime against God, the high priest, priesthood of Eli is going to be remo removed from one of the high priesthood families of Aaron and be going to be switched over and given to another because, listen, but because God is so merciful, listen, right away he's going to kill the two sons in Eli. They're going to die to sin unto death. And the rest of this family is going to be covered. Listen, this will not go out until Solomon has become king. David has turned it over to Solomon. This shows you the long-suffering and patience of God with people. I mean, he's not, he's not interested in destroying people. He wants to get them saved. Second, second Peter 3, 9. God is not willing that any perish, but all come to save. And people say, well, why did he wait so long to take care of this family? I mean, that's a long time to, to cover that. He said, they're going to, they're, listen, you're not going to have an old man in your family ever. And the priesthood is going, going out. But listen, it took from the time of Samuel through the period of the judges, kings, go, we got to go through King Saul, go through King David. Now, you understand in the history here? To get to Solomon. When he removes it, Solomon takes the one out and puts the other in. <laughs> that's amazing. I mean, you ought to be thankful that that's the kind of a God that we serve. I know I am. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you. You can read about all about this if you're interested at the passage of First King and Second, First Kings one and two. Now, in closing today, point four: the only sin that's passed on generationally is Adam's original sin. Adam's original sin, the AOS. It is passed on to all members of the human race throughout all of human history. Romans 5.12, therefore, just as through one man, Adam, you can know that if you read the whole passage, through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death through that sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. There it is. Right? The full passage is 12 through 21. And P Paul comes back in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 15, 22, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, and he, he uses federal heads of the human race. For the unbeliever, he says, in Adam, all uh, that's the all, all unsaved, in Adam all die. That's spiritual. In Christ, that's the saved, will all be made alive. That's the direct opposite of death. Spiritual death, spiritual life. And that life is eternal. So who sinned? Those in Adam have all sinned. Who sinned? But what about the man born blind? Well, he was born dead. He was born blind. He was born in darkness. The 13th judicial charges was upon his life, just like everybody else, with the exception of Jesus Christ. Later, he is saved. And the blindness of his soul is removed. He got his physical sight. Listen, he got his physical sight and didn't get saved. If you read chapter 9, when Jesus healed him, he wasn't saved. He was set up for God to do a wonderful work to prove that Jesus was the Messiah and could fulfill Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. It was a sign to Israel. It was a sign to Israel. But when Jesus heard, when you read chapter 9 of John, down verse 35, 36, when Jesus heard that the, Jew, when the Jews put him out again, put him out, excommunicated him, which meant you can't get a job, you can't do this, you can't do that. It was a bigger deal than just kicking him out of the church. He kicked him out of society. Jesus, when Jesus heard they put him out, he went and found him. It's a wonderful story about the compassion of Christ. He went and found him. And here's what Jesus said. Look at me. Now he could, couldn't he? He said, do you believe in the son of man? And he said, Lord, I believe. And you know, that's all it takes to get saved. 
Do you believe that I've come into this world to die on a cross, to be buried and raised from the dead? Do you believe I'm the son of man? That's what that meant. Do you believe that I have come on a mission to save your soul and not just to save you, save you from a physical blindness, but from spiritual blindness? And he said, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Now, he'd been telling them all about Christ who had healed him. He finally found out who he was. So he kept saying, I don't know who did it. I just know I got it. I mean, I, here's the famous line, I once was blind him, now I see. That famous line. See, there's two forms of blindness that need to be removed. This man had physical blindness, got it removed, and was spiritually blind and got it removed. He got physical blindness, had nothing to do with salvation, had to do with Christ being the Messiah. It was a sign to Israel. When they mistreated him and treated, threw him under the bus, as I say, he went and found him. And listen, you know how you get saved? By believing. You, not, not, not any other way. You believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. You believe it because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, least any man should boast. If you think you're going another way, You've been deceived by the master liar. Not going to get there. You're going to get there. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I am the mediator between God and sinful man. I am the mediator between a holy God and an, un and an unholy person. And there's hope for every one of us. I love what Paul Paul said in that first uh, Timothy 1.15. Christ came to save sinners. Christ came to save sinners. And I'll tell you, I consider myself among the worst. Because I, I was out to kill every person to make their life as miserable as I could. Every person that believed in Jesus Christ, I was opposed to. He... In the King James, he said, I am the chief. I am the first. I am. In Acts 26, 18, Paul said. Salvation is about having your eyes opened so that you can turn from darkness to light. From the domain of Satan to the domain to the kingdom of God that you may receive forgiveness of sins and may receive an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in Christ. And buddy, it don't get better than that. Let us pray. Don't miss what you have to do, those with me on the internet tonight. These people understand that because I preach it all the time. You need to understand. I don't know what you think you've got to do to be saved. But you have to, you do nothing but believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. The power to save you is in the gospel that you're going to believe. The gospel, Romans 1, 16, the gospel is the power of God and salvation. Therefore, you're saved by God's grace, not by your works. It's a gift. And if, if you'll have the, the good sense to believe it, God will have the grace to save you forever. Not just, not just for a day, not just for a while, not, not for a week, not for a year, forever. So we thank you for that, Father. We pray those who have heard us tonight would come to an understanding of a couple things. One, we've dealt with salvation. We've dealt with false assumptions and how they, how they can wreck your life. How the word of God is, is the truth. And, and you got to come back to that to correct all that foolishness. We, we have studied tonight and, and emphasized the fact that the home, the Christian home, is the first place of worship. It should be the majority place of worship. Everything else could be blown away in a tornado here in the south in Alabama. 
we could still gather and worship. It's not dependent on a on a building or a location, but upon people who have common interest in the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The home. The home is the first place of worship. I suppose in reality your heart is, but talking about a group setting. If we get the idea that the only place that we can worship God is in a building off somewhere, nothing could be farther from the truth. I mean, Adam and Eve didn't have it. All the generations to know it didn't. We didn't get into this until we had Moses. And we had a tabernacle and a temple, which was that Christ is everything. So here we are. We thank you for our study tonight. These have come our way by the automobile and the internet. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mm-hmm.